Okay, everyone, I hope you can hear me all right. Yeah. All right, hello there. Uh, my name is Jen Stirrup, and we're going to talk today about Agile Notebooks. Now, I should say that um, people are probably wondering where the accent is from. I am Scottish, and at this time in the afternoon after lunch, I am most likely to send you to sleep than anything else. It's quite warm in here, it's quite dark, cozy. So hopefully you'll get so excited by Azure Notebooks, I won't have too many people snoring in the audience. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them as I go along. Um, I can only see the, a few rows from the front, so if people are up the back and they've got questions, you might have to stand, do a Mexican wave or something like that, okay? I will get to you when I see you, just big light, small person. All right, so the purpose of this session is for those of people who are interested in getting started with data science in Azure. Now, Azure notebooks make it very easy to move from being a developer to incorporating data science skills in your skill set. So Microsoft provide an Azure hosted notebook, a solution uh, which offers very low overhead in order to get started with data science. It also allows you opportunities for collaboration, which is great. You can start to share your work. We can use different languages in it, and they have great power and great flexibility. So in this session, what we will do is we'll talk about Azure Notebooks, why they're useful, and we'll also see, um, see them in action. So that's who I am. So if anyone is in the wrong session, now is a good time to leave. No one will look at you. It will be fine, okay? It has happened before. So that's who I am. Um, I work for myself because um, I'm a terrible employee, basically. I'm not unhirable, but I am unemployable. I've worked for myself for nearly nine years now. So I have a great boss, what can I say? I spoil myself rotten. So, I, which is great because I tend to do things that I like, and there's nothing better than doing technology and things that you love. So my background originally was artificial intelligence, and I did a postgraduate degree in that 23 years ago. Very long time, time goes by very quickly. So what happened is artificial intelligence, believe it or not, suddenly became not cool. And that was about the year 2000. Everyone was worried about the year 2000's problem. Anyone under 40 probably doesn't remember that, but it was a big thing at the time. So everyone became Y2K consultants, and artificial intelligence got pushed by the side a little bit. Then Google came along, they renamed it Search Technologies, and artificial intelligence entered another of its winters. Now, I'm very glad to say that AI has started to become cool again, and I've waited this long in my life to be cool, so I finally made it, which is great. It's been a long time. Um, so while I uh, wasn't doing artificial intelligence, I did business intelligence. I was accustomed to pulling down lots of data. So if anybody here does business intelligence, you're familiar with SQL, you do reports, you push data around, then that's a really good place to be because you can springboard from those skills to learning about AI. The concepts are quite similar. And believe me, there is dirty data everywhere, okay? It's in AI, it's in business intelligence, it's not going anywhere. Okay, so I'm happy for people to take photos of the slides at any time. If you want to get in touch afterwards, my details are there. Um, I am in Twitter. Uh, Twitter is a good place to start. Having 160 characters usually means that people's questions are really simple because <laughs> you can't fit much in. So I'm happy to take LinkedIn connections as well. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, uh, which means that I like the sound of my own voice talking about data science, I think. Um, I'm a regional director as well. and. Um, there's not very many of us, about 180, and we interact with Microsoft at a more senior level. Uh, presumably, I, I talk even more in that role as well. So, what I'd like to do is explain a little bit about notebooks. Now, the way that they actually work 
It's really interesting. Now, there's quite a difference between programming in a notebook and programming in something like SQL Server Management Studio or Visual Studio or something like that. It's a different style of programming. For a start, it's very minimalist, which I personally quite like. There's not too much happening in the screen. But we like notebooks because basically we can see our code, comments, and our results all in one place, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't often see comments. I like comments in code. I call me old fashioned. They help me to get to understand people's code really quickly. I don't often see them as much as I'd like. But the really nice thing about Jupyter in particular is it encourages you to have your code, your comments, and your results. I don't know about you, but I don't tend to program data very linearly. I don't think in a linear fashion. Partly that's because my customers don't think in a linear fashion either. They jump around with data. Anyone who's handled any type of data will know that customers and users will never say, I've got enough data now, I've got enough reports, we're done. That never happens, okay? So if anyone's looking for a career move, being in data is a really good place to be. You know, just giving people what they want and the more they, you know, the more you give them, the more they want. It's a good thing. So what I find is when I'm looking through code and, and looking through data, I'll start to go down a particular path. Then I'll go back up to the original question I was thinking about, and then I might go down another path. Jupyter's nice because it allows me to do that because I can go back, just run the codes that I did five minutes ago, see the results, and then change a bit and move forward from there. Some of the projects I do are quite complex. Um, so I work with a charity called DataKind as a volunteer now and again, because obviously I've got nothing else to do except work all the time, but I really enjoy it. And what DataKind do is we bring our data science skill set to charity data. And we have data science hackathons where we help a charity get to a good place with their data. So if anyone is interested in learning data science, I would recommend that you look up these charities such as DataKind because it means that you get to join in and you learn and you code and you make a great impact straight away. Now because you're surfing around data, you're not always thinking very linearly, particularly if it's not your data set that you're thinking about. And that's where the notebooks come in quite handy. So as we'll see in the demo, we don't just have codes, we've got images in there. You could put in a video if you want. Uh, you could have charts and graphs appearing as well. So they're very flexible and very engaging. I believe personally in visualizing data. Now I know that that sounds like the soft furnishings of the tech industry, data visualization. You know, people worry about color palettes and, you know, things like that. But actually, it's a really important skill to have, and it becomes even more important when you're dealing with things like data science and artificial intelligence, because you have to explain very difficult concepts to people who've never come across these things before, like charities, for example. So that's what I find so engaging about Jupyter Notebooks. It meets the user where they are, it's very sympathetic to the fact that we don't think linearly. It's also a great way of communicating the insights from your data out to everyone who's looking at your notebook because you can share them. Because we are moving towards a much more collaborative world and I think it's a nice place to be. So Jupyter itself is open source. We do know that Microsoft are huge fans of open source software. It's a very interactive way of doing data science as well. You can also use it for scientific computing as well. And it has um, lots of different programming languages in it. We'll talk a bit about that shortly. But essentially, a Jupyter Notebook is a web application. It allows you to create and share your code in a document format. And you can use it for anything that you might want to do with data, such as cleaning your data, 
transforming the data. The, the kind of thing people think isn't very cool. You have to engineer your data. I find it personally really rewarding. I like seeing the data starting in a bad place, then moving it and cleaning it so it becomes better. I personally really like that. You could also use it for statistical modeling and for numerical simulation as well. You can use it for machine learning. So, so the note, Jupyter itself has got support for over 40 programming languages. But what we do have is in the Azure notebooks is that it supports Python, it supports R, and it supports F Sharp as well. So that's where they're focusing right now. When we look in the demo, we can see the kernel and how easy it is to swap them back and forth. Ah, there we go. So we can also use it to access big data as well. And I feel that people get sometimes quite hung up on how much data they have. But the main thing is about having the tools and the concepts in order to handle the big data. Now, the really nice thing about using Azure notebooks, using the Jupyter notebooks in Azure, means that the data can be stored in Azure. I'll show you how we put the data into blob storage, and then we can access it using the Azure notebooks. That's really nice because it's a very cheap way of storing data. It's already in Azure Blob Storage. We can pop it up there. And I think that's one of the advantages of Azure Notebook is actually how do you support that and how do you make sure it's part of the way that your organization starts to support data science. So to summarize, uh, Jupyter itself is a rich web uh, client you can do all sorts of uh, different, really cool things with it. We've got some sample visualizations there. Um, we can have those embedded in our code. So I'm going to focus particularly in Jupyter. We could have used R or F Sharp as well. And we can also get code samples from GitHub. Now, I think personally, I, I thought it was great that Microsoft bought GitHub. I was really happy to see that. I can see the dots joining together. And what I like is I can go and get samples from GitHub, put them in Azure Notebook really easily. I don't know how you learn. I personally learn by breaking things and then apologizing profusely afterwards. And I'm really good at apologizing. I've got plenty of practice because I think we learn by sort of breaking bits of code and trying to work out stuff. Yeah, that's how I do it. Some people learn by listening, some people learn by reading, and some learn by doing. And I'm a doing type of learner. And I like Jupyter notebooks particularly because they allow me to do, then undo, apologize usually, then redo. And they allow that format to take place quite easily. So I like that. Facilitates my uh, way of approaching problems, which is to try something, see if it works, and then keep going from there. So we have, um, the way that we use this is we put our code into cells and then we execute the code in the, shell, in the a little cell and I'll show you how that works. So the notebook mode is known as literate computing and it means that you can reproduce your code as well by sharing it. So it's really nice, I think, particularly if you're doing research to be able to share your notebooks and share your code show your data because this is an Azure and do that very, very easily. It's streamlining that data science process. I don't know if you see this in the industry, but I certainly see and the business users, companies are really impatient. They want everything to work yesterday and they're not going to wait two years for you to build a data warehouse so they can then have their data. That used to be the case 20 years ago, it's not now. Everything is speeded up so quickly. And the nice thing is about having your data in Azure and the notebooks is then we can start to share those and hopefully progress to meet the speed of the business, the business speed that they require things in. Okay, because the way that we work is computers deal with code and data and the data is a very important part of what we do. 
And what we can start to see is how that works in Jupiter. So I'll show you that. So I just wanted to give you just a few um, pointers in order to get started, and then we'll have a look at a notebook ourselves. Okay, so it's basically the um, HTML based notebook environment. It's got the kernel behind it. Now, the really nice thing about having it in Azure is that Azure takes care of the performance and the setup for you. Now, I don't know if you've started to use the Azure Data Science Virtual Machine, because uh, that's another opportunity to learn data science. I actually think it's better to get started using Azure Notebooks, because in the Azure Data Science Virtual Machine, you have to spin up a lot of services, and sometimes it can be hard to install Python, the environment variable maybe doesn't get set properly, you don't know which version you're using, and actually it's harder to install than people think, unless you install something like Anaconda that will do that for you, which is always good. So, but the nice thing about Azure Notebooks is you just set up your notebook, and Azure works it out for you behind the scenes, and I think that's what's really lovely about it. So it allows us to visualize our data as well. Um, just a few more references um, in case um, you want to start to pick up some more. Then we'll go into the demo. I'm just keen to give you some references to get started. I recognize some people learn better by reading. I just happen to be learn by doing. Um, but the idea here is here's some great opportunities to just, I would recommend take a screenshot of that. And I also like uh, Wes McKinney's book about Python data analysis that's published by O'Reilly. Loads of great examples in there to get started. Um, so this is where you can start to see the Python documentation and the Jupyter documentation coming in as well. Um, so that's another good place to get some more resources. And uh, here's just a few more examples as well. So what I'd like to do is I'm just going, I don't believe in PowerPointing people to death, um, especially at two o'clock in a warm, cozy room, because, uh, you know, you will fall asleep. That's what happens. Uh, so what I'd like to do is go in and show you the Azure Notebook. So um, I'm going to use Zoomit, and I'll show you how we access it, first of all. So the URL that you're looking for, I hope you can see that, is um, https notebooks.azure.com. Now that's in preview. All oh, right, it's not showing, isn't it? All oh, right, okay, let's see. Thanks for that, sorry. I wondered when Terry at the back started to move down. So, so there we go. Um, sorry, I'll get back through that again. So the URL that you're looking for is notebooks.azure.com. And at the moment, um, when you start to log in, uh, you can see that it currently it's in preview. So it's a good time to get started with it. It's in preview, which means that it might change now and again. There'll be things happening behind the scenes. So I'm just warning you, it's in preview. So you've had that caveat before we get started. So what you do need is an Azure subscription. Obviously, you can start to sign up for those for free. Uh, so once you've signed up for Azure, which I won't take you through, uh, what we've got here is you've got my projects. So I talked a lot about notebooks, but notebooks are actually organized into projects. It's just such a nice way of organizing things by topic. Um, I work for myself, so I do things for different customers. So I might have a customer per project. So when we click on projects, you can start to see that I've got a lot of projects down here. I'll go to the one which I'm going to use. So 
So what we can see here is um, inside this project, so I've called this particular project MS Build 2019. It wasn't very imaginative, but I thought, well, I will go with that. I don't do imaginative when I'm naming stuff. So what we've got here is um, we've got this running on free compute. So when you sign up, originally you're on the free compute service, but if you have any Azure virtual machines, um, what you can do is then um, you would have, you'd be able to click on the drop down list and you'd be able to run the, run um, and connect to the Azure virtual machine, run your Python from there, for example. I'm just using the free one just now. Um, it takes some time, it takes a, we've only got an hour, so you can go and have a look at how to set that up. Now, I've got some interesting things that we can do. So when we go back to projects, I just want to show you this. What you can do, start again. You've got this where you can upload a GitHub repo, okay? So what we can do is go to GitHub and upload one of their, um, one of their repositories. So say you've got, uh, you use TensorFlow. I'm going to quickly search for that. Now I'll just look for the TensorFlow one. Now I've picked the TensorFlow one quite specifically. I know that um, there's been some talk about TensorFlow, it's something that I see is being quite popular. But what you could do is um, you can actually upload one of these uh, tutorials. And what you could do there is start to upload one of the GitHub repos for TensorFlow and put that in the Azure Notebook. And the reason I mention that is because if I tend to see that when I'm working with data scientists, actually when I work with IT departments quite often, they've got a cottage industry of technology. So they've got different types of technologies all over the place. And, but that can make it quite hard to support but by moving things into Azure just means it's sometimes easier for the IT teams just to streamline that support. And they know where they are then. They're not looking after 10 different things. They've got enough to do usually. So we can start to upload one of these repos as well. So we can go down to tutorials. And we've got, um, we could upload just any one of these. So if we go to this one, M-N-I-S-T. We could just upload this uh, particular URL and that would be imported straight into our notebook. I'm not going to do that because it takes some time. But all you need to do actually is take the URL from the top and then upload it from here. So then we could upload our GitHub repo from here. And then we can clone it, and then we are ready to go. So the one that I'm going to use is I'm going to set up an experiment, which is looking at the number of sunspots and trying to work out if we can predict how those appear in the future. So before I do anything else, um, I want to show you exactly where we get the data from. So credits to the Sunspot Index and long-term solar observations. What we're going to do is take this data. I'm going to show you how we upload it into Azure, and then we're going to work with the data using the Azure Notebook. Okay. Now, it's really hard to get a data set which is quite neutral. I never like doing football or sports because I don't know anything about sports. And if I mention one team, I'm guaranteed to upset someone else and then it's just, it all goes wrong. So we're going to stick with sunspots because we all, we all know what the sun is. So we're going to do that. So credit to them. And we could take any one of these data sets. So the one that we are going to use 
is this one. We're going to look at the average number of sunspots that appear every month. So when we download this data, I've got an Excel already. So I still love Excel. I know we've got the rest of lots of other tools now, but I still love Excel. It will always have a special place in my heart. So here's what the data actually looks like. And the Excel is just a nice way of showing it. It has its Power BI. So this is what the data looks like. Um, we can see that the data goes back for a very, very long period of time. So it goes back to 1749. So that's when people started to record the number of sunspots. So we've got the year. We've got the year in fractions, because I hope you can see that the data is recorded monthly. So that's uh, 1749. So, um, and then we can see the monthly average uh, number of sunspots, which is in this column here. Then we can see whether the data is provisional, for example, or whether it's confirmed or not. But the way that this particular lab works is um, they will go and they will verify the data, but sometimes that might take a little while. But so if the data is still to be verified, they're marking it in that column as being provisional. So that's what the data looks like when we see it in Excel. So when we go to the Azure portal, which I'll just uh, load up here, so this is my Azure portal, and what I've got here is I've got some storage. And this is essentially just blob storage. I've got a container called Data Science Demos. And then we can see I've already got um, a lot of files in here. So I've just used CSV files because they're, they're nice and quick to load. Also, if anyone wants to try these exercises and things that I'm doing, it's a nice, easy format. It's a lowest common denominator. So we can upload files quite easily. Got the upload file here. The other thing that I do need to have is I need to have the key and the details in order to be able to access the Azure storage blob. So let's go back to the code and I'll have a quick look in how we do that. So just to summarize before we proceed, what we're doing is I've downloaded the Sunspot number data from this uh, scientific repository here. They're based in Brussels, in case anyone's interested. And what, we're going, what I've done is I have uploaded the CSV data into Azure Blob Storage. And that's the name of the file here. And that's a monthly format which we know from the title just there. So then when I've uploaded the data, the first thing I do need to do is have a think about how can I get my Azure notebook to really understand and see that data that's in Azure blob storage. So I'll show you how we do that. So there's a few characteristics of the blob storage that we actually need. The first thing we actually need is the account name. So here it's called Data Relish Demos. I'll show you where that is in the Azure portal. I go to All Resources. I'm going to look for my storage account. We can see here, Data Relish Demos is actually the name of the storage account, and that matches what I've got here in this piece of code. I just need the account's name here. So then I need to go back to the portal, and I need to get the storage key. So I can get the access keys on the left-hand side. And the access for doing that is over here. 
So I can see I've just double checked that's the storage name, data relish demos. And then I've got one of the keys here. I've also got the connection string, which I'm going to use this particular key here in green. The storage key begins with the same characters. We know it's the same one. So once we've done that, it needs the container name, which I've called demo. And then it needs the name of the file. And it also needs um, an output as well, which I've just simply called output CSV. So when we go back to the portal, we can see, and um, I'll go back to the demo um, just there. Data relish demos. And then I've got blobs down here on the left-hand side. And that's me accessing the blob storage. And I've got demo, which is the name of the container. And then I can see the files in here in this folder. And that's how we actually access and tie together Azure notebooks with the data. So because we're using Azure Blob Storage, you can imagine we can put a lot of data up into Azure. And that's what's quite interesting about it. We can start to think about using big data sources. So we'll leave the portal just now. And what we'll do is we'll have a look at the Azure notebook itself before we dive into the code. Now, the first thing to notice is this is the notebook that's inside uh, my project. So the first thing I'd like to do is draw your attention. Oops. To the languages that are available in the Azure notebooks at the moment. So basically it's a Jupyter notebook hosted in Azure and Microsoft Azure will work out and set up and configure this kernel for you. And it's such a great way to get started with data science, I think, because you don't have to install anything. Um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to install Python, more difficult than it should be, unless you use Anaconda. But here we've got different flavors of Python. We've got 2, 3, and 3.6. We've also got R in there as well, and also got F Sharp in there too. So the nice thing about that is you can change kernel inside the notebook as you go along. And it's nice because it means you can get started. You don't have to actually try and and install anything. So there's a few things to note. Um, so what we can do is we can checkpoint the file if you want to do that and have different versions of it. Always good if you're the kind of person that I am. I like to break stuff, go back, fix it, and move forward. Um, editing the notebook, you see here we've got these cells. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so here's one of the cells here. Click on that one. Now this is just basically some markdown. And all I've done here is just a, a need memoir and a credit to the people who actually generated the data in the first place. These people here. So what we've got here is um, we can actually add in different packages to the Python kernel. We can see the kernel over here in the right hand side. The name of the project is here, called MS Build. We've got the version of Python here, which is Python 3.6. And this is trusted, um, a trusted uh, notebook. And I've, we've also got the Python logo at the top. So the first thing I've done is put in some comments. Now, what you can do is um, you can add in an extra cell at the top, cell above. I'm going to type in this as a comment cell. And what we can do is you can see that there are different things we can do with that cell. We could have it as a heading. We could have it as code and markdown. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that as a markdown. I'm going to click on it. And that just allows us to put a cell where we want it to go and then run it, whether it's a comment or whether it's a code or results. So then the next thing that I've got here is in Python, um, I've started to import a lot of the libraries. Now, some of these will be familiar to anyone who's used Python. 
So here we've got uh, Pandas, for example, which is a really great one for trying to munge data and just trying to crunch through data. That's one of Python's strengths, I think. It's designed for difficult data cleansing jobs, I think, and I think that's a really good thing. So the first thing we need to do is we need to import all of these libraries, and that makes it really flexible. The next thing we do after that is it's just good practice to have all the libraries up at the top. Sorry, can you, hi, is there a question? Um, libraries that have not been installed, um, you should be able just to call them. I, th I think what happens is it's going to install it for you behind the scenes. There's some other, uh, at the end I'll dig out some notes for you on that, but I'm sure it'll go off and just install it for you using pip. So, and I think that's pretty cool actually. There's so many different things um, we can do with the language, it's very, very interesting. Oh sorry, yes, hello. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? The, the problem is I'm, I'm being blasted with air conditioning or something. Uh, can you attach Git repository or connect to Git repository? To a Git repository? Yes, to track um, the changes of the notebook. And um, we'll have a look at the end. Um, that's not something I've looked at, but we can see if we can do that, because you can definitely import from GitHub, so you must be able to push back as well. So we've got the Azure um, account here, so that was the details we looked at earlier. So we'll, I won't go and run it again because it's going to take some time to go and get. But here, what you do need, and there's actually, you can get this from Azure. Uh, you can get the documentation on how to do this. But you do have to go and import um, from Azure, block blob, se blob service. And the reason for that is it's just so it can go and access the data in Azure. Now this is very easy to set up and you can get the documentation on that, it's on the Microsoft website. And all I've done here is um, all the variables that I used previously for Azure, they've all been concatenated together and they get, go to this particular function here, get blob to path, and that gives it everything it needs in order to go and get the data. So all I've done here is when I've got the data, is I'm reading in the CSV file. In the CSV file, I've just assigned it to a variable called my data file. And all of that gets assigned to this particular variable here, sunspot data. So that variable name is going to hold my data for me. And that data will have been retrieved from Azure and from blob storage. And it'll be popped into that variable there. So I've gone and got a few different, uh, different uh, files here. Uh, we won't go through all those. But basically, it's the same process. You can upload more than one file. You just have to make sure and call this particular service. So now that we've installed and uploaded our libraries, we've got our data, we can start to use it pretty much like any other any other piece of Python code that we're doing, which I think is really cool. You can get up to speed quite quickly. We've not installed anything. So what we've got here is I just wanted to print out the data for you. We can see what it looks like. Year, month, we've got the year and fractions. Monthly means sunspot number. And we can see that that actually matches the headings here. It's the same file. Now, you probably noticed this thing up here, update now. I'm absolutely not going to do that in the middle of a demo. It will have to wait till afterwards. I'm sure there's, if there's one thing worse than having to do that yourself, it's watching someone else doing it. So be with me. I'm sure Excel will stagger through to the end of the session <laughs> without updating. <laughs> Please don't do that to me. <laughs> so um, then we can start to explore the data. Now I'm a consultant, I work for myself, and I often get data sets which I have never seen before. And the likelihood that they've done anything approaching a data dictionary is pretty low. So I've been in AI and business intelligence for 23 years, and I think I've seen two customers who've done a data dictionary. Does anyone here have one? 
No, exactly. <laughs> There's, <laughs> I rest my case, okay? So that, because people don't really explore their data. And the reason they don't want to do it is because they think it's getting nasties in there and they're probably right, okay? So that's, that's the problem. But then we start to look at the data. And so what we can do is this little command here, describe, I think Oracle's got the same command actually, and it's in a SQL, it'd be a C, um, SB help. And what we've got here is just the column names. And it does a nice thing where it's going to try and work out the descriptive statistics of the data for you. Now, when I'm building data warehouses and things like that, I very rarely see anyone use descriptive statistics at all for any data. And you think, well, what's the point of that? And I'll give you an example. I did some work for the NHS in the UK, and all they wanted to know was the average number of bed days, people that's, you know, sleeping in beds, who had diabetes. And you think, well, that's easy, right? You just count up the total number of overnight stays in hospital, divide it by the number of patients who've got diabetes, that gives us the average. Didn't work like that, because a lot of the data had got mixed up, and they actually, it was about the dates, so they'd actually, the admissions date of the patient going into hospital was actually after the release date, so when you, did a difference between the two numbers, it was a negative number, because the release date was before the admission date. Does that make sense? Well, it shouldn't, but, and that's kind of the point. So it meant that you had people staying in hospital for a negative number of days, and had one poor person that was in hospital for minus 189 days, because they'd swapped around the admission and the release date. And the reason I found it was because I did some very simple descriptive statistics just like this. What was the minimum number? The minimum number came up as a negative and straight away that told me there's something wrong here. So if you're not doing basic, simple descriptive statistics, I recommend that you do. People will think you're a genius in the office because you'll pick out that kind of thing that has a big business impact, okay? Because sometimes the stuff I do is not very smart. I just ask the right question and nobody's checked before. Um, so I have lots of war wounds about that. But doing something like this is actually really important from a business point of view. Because it just, some of it just doesn't make sense. Um, I had one customer that couldn't work out the median for four years. Things like that. And I don't know why, I've just never figured it out. But it's when you start to help people to do things, you realise that they are in quite a mess with their data. Okay. So we can see here, what I've done is I've assigned a new variable called new sunspot data. And what I've done is, I've only given that two columns. I've given it the year month, and I've given it the monthly mean sunspot number. So basically all I've done is taken this bigger data set and just cut out the columns that I, that I don't need. Um, so then we can do some nice things. We can start to print the data which is what we see here. We've got the year month, and then we've got the monthly mean sunspot number. Now, the really interesting thing about this is when we start to look at it, we can start to see patterns emerging. Now, I like patterns in data. It tells me that there's something interesting happening. We actually have patterns in data all the time. That could be seasonal Christmas shopping. It could be people buying concert tickets. Speak, uh, peaks and troughs in the data. So that tells you something's happening. And these are the kind of patterns we're looking for, particularly when we're looking at things like patient data or customer data, what's happening. We start to see cycles appearing. So that starts to pique our interest a bit. So what we can start to do is um, with uh, this sort of code in Python, we can start to do some interesting things around splitting the data into a training set and a test set. Now, this is something that's very important when we are building models in data science, and Python has got loads of different functionality for doing that. Now, when we look at time series data, it's actually a bit more interesting because we have to keep the sequential nature of the data. We can't just say, oh, well, we'll mix up January and put it next to April. 
It's not going to work like that. We need that sequence. So what we've got here is uh, we are keeping that sequence and just splitting it into testing and training sets. So what we can do there is once we have split it into our test and training set, is we can start to do some predictions on it. So based on the training data set, we can start to do some predictions on how the sunspot data may appear in the future. So we can see here using this pattern, the red is the predictions, and that's how sunspot data may appear later in the future. And the code to do that is, um, is just here. We're using a training set and a test set. And then we're just plotting it. And I've used the most simple data set for that, the one with the two columns. And I've split the data into a training set, which is 66% of the full set. And then the test set is basically everything that's left. And I've printed out the observations and some sample data. And then it's just trying to look for patterns in the data. So that makes uh, something quite interesting. So uh, just one last thing really to show you. We can uh, just a uh, quick overview. We can start to do some really nice data visualizations in Python and have those appear in the notebook. So what this is trying to do is um, this is autocorrelation. It's the linear correlation of a signal with itself, two points in time. Now, when we do time series data, we're trying to understand uh, what happens in patterns in the data over time. But we're also trying to think about are those patterns really there? So what happens if we take a step back and we start the sequence in December? Does that make a difference? Or what happens if the, we start that in February? Does that make a difference? So we call that the lag. And all we're doing is that like a window over the data to try and look for those patterns. So that's what autocorrelation is. It's trying to work out, is the, are the pattern really there? What happens if we shift that back one, shift it back two? Sometimes you find that if you do too many shifts, um, you start to lose the pattern. And that's OK. It's a good thing in itself to know and understand that's happening. And the closer you get back to the starting point, the relationships in the data become stronger again. So that might tell you something's happening in January that's not happening consistently that we don't see other times in the year. So we don't see our summer sales appearing in March. We don't find the same pattern there. So when we start to look at our data, it becomes quite interesting. Uh, we can start to fit um, a best line in the data as well. Um, so where do we think the prediction might go and what actually happens to it? If we can do all of this in Azure using Jupyter Notebooks. And at the moment, it's free uh, because it's in preview. So it's a great opportunity to go grab some data, grab some code from GitHub, just try it and see what happens. So just uh, one last thing to show you. We can print out more of the data. And this is what the forecast actually looks like. And um, what we've got here is the actual data that we've taken from 1950. I hope you can see that all right. I'll just zoom in a bit better. OK. Um, so we've got the years down the bottom. We've got the actual data in the blue line. So we can see how that looks. And then what we're trying to do in the red line is do some forecasting. And then we can see if we hit the target or not. So we've got um, the uncertainty here, and that's where it thinks it might go next. We'd probably keep playing with the data to see how it looks. But we can do some really nice things with it. So I'm just going to go back to the notebook itself. So just a few things to show you. If you want to change the kernel at any point, we can just go back to change kernel, just a quick summary. So if you want, you could use Python for part of the notebook, then dip into R to do some stat stuff. And I think personally, the Python visualizations are really cool. You've got Seaborn, you've got Matplotlib, uh, these different libraries to make the data visualization really interesting. And we can also go up to connect up to Azure as well. So we could do that. Um, so that would just connect us to the Azure subscription.
So do you want this project to use it as your credentials? Um, grant access, yes I do, thank you very much. So I'm happy with that. So now it's going to log me into Azure in the normal way, which is very cool. So it knows who I am already because we have got the, it's got my login over here, I'm already logged in. So once we have done that, I can save and checkpoint, or I could revert to a checkpoint as well. If you want to show your work to other people, you can have a slideshow as well, which is quite cute. So I'll just go back to the summary. I'm not doing an update for PowerPoint either. That's not going to happen. So, okay, so just a quick summary here. And then any questions? Okay. So just a quick summary, using the Jupyter Notebooks hosted in Azure, we can have fun with our data in Azure, all in blob storage. We can use it to get started with Python and R, um, if that's some, something your company's thinking about doing. And if you're already using Python or TensorFlow or anything like that, you can start to think about hosting those in Azure um, just to try and make the support more streamlined, make it more easy. Um, you've got your data in one place, which we always like. And we can also have our data in, in one place, which is always good. I personally don't like 10 different data stores all over the place. I don't know which version is the version of the truth, if there is one. And we can also share um, the Jupyter Notebooks as well. And that's quite easy to do. Go back to the portal here. I can download them. I, can, I could download that and share it that way. I can also move it to different uh, folders if I want. And then I could stop the kernel if that was an issue. We get project settings here. And set up different environments too. And if you want, uh, when you go to preview, there's actually lots of different um, sample notebooks to go and get started with as well. Uh, so you could go and just um, sign up for Azure. Uh, sign up for the notebook and then go and try some of the tutorials that they will set up for you. I believe when you sign up, actually, it gives you um, a sample no notebook to go and get started. Yes, it does. There it is. As your email getting started. That will help you to get started with it. All right, so I'm conscious I've got about five minutes to go. If anyone has any questions, I'll need to take the question about GitHub offline and have a look. Um, I can't see any immediate way to do that. Vitell, if you want, if we can talk at the end, we'll get your details and come back. Did you have another question? Yeah, um, so can this be run in batch mode once the notebook is ready? I'm sorry, can you speak more slowly because I've got air conditioning blasting and I can't he make you sure. out very well. Once the notebook is ready, can it be run in batch mode? Can you run it in batch mode? Um, I would need to look at that as well, actually. Um, I think it's still in previews, still early days, which is why it still looks like some of the functionality is missing. I've just been able to run and explore the data like this. Um, I can double check if that's there, but like I say, it's just early days at this moment in time. Okay, the batch mode and also if it can be uh, deployed as a service, mm. it can be consumed like REST API. Yeah, that's right, yep, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Right, if there's no more questions, if you want to grab a coffee before everyone else does, then I'm happy with that. But I'll be hanging around at the end anyway, if there's any individual questions. But thank you all very much for coming, and I hope you enjoy Microsoft Build, and thank you for having me along. <laughs>